Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Janice Hume. I am the head of the Department of Journalism here um, in the College of Journalism and Mass Communication, and thank you for being here. For more than four decades, our college has welcomed significant figures in journalism to the University of Georgia to help us honor Ralph McGill's um, courage as an editor. McGill was regarded as the conscience of the South um, for his work at the Atlanta Constitution that challenged racial segregation in the 1950s and 1960s. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing in 1959. Today marks the 42nd McGill Lecture. In 2007, we added the McGill Symposium, bringing together students, faculty, and leading journalists to consider what journalistic courage means and how it is exemplified by reporters and editors. Earlier today, journalists from across the country joined 12 McGill Fellows, students selected by faculty committee for their strengths in academics, practical experience, <coughs> and leadership for the 15th annual McGill Symposium. Special thanks to our visiting journalist uh, journalists, excuse me, Andrea Bruce, Kristen Chick, Larry Hobbs, Sarah Wire, and Omar Jimenez. In 2009, we expanded the program yet again when we awarded the first McGill Medal to, to a U.S. journalist whose career has exemplified journalistic courage. This year's fellows selected <laughs> the 2022 McGill Medalist recipient, <clears throat> whom, you'll, whom you'll meet momentarily. Um, based on nominations submitted by journalists and journalism educators from throughout the country. But first, before we get to the medal winner, let me introduce this year's class of McGill Fellows. When I call your name, if you'd please come forward to receive your graduation honor cord. Matthew Brown. Brown. Yay, he just walked in. <laughs> Sydney Fordyce. Please applaud. <laughs> Congratulations. Ashley Galanti, Reeves Jackson, Kira Posey, Catherine Skeen, Brianna Smith, Delaney Tarr, Palmer Tomes, Donna Trailer, Julia Walkup, and Janelle Ward. Big hand for all of these McGill Fellows. They, they are terrific students. We would also uh, like to give a shout out and thanks to the faculty members who have given their time this year to help make this program possible. And that would be Dodie Cantrell Bickley, Dean Charles Davis, uh, Keith Herndon, uh, me, nothing like thanking yourself, um, Mark Johnson, Kaiser Lowe, Vicki Michaelis, and Diane Murray. Representing this year's fellows, Kira Posey will now present the 2021 McGill Medal for Journalistic Courage. Thank you, and I'm excited to introduce our medal recipient and our guest today. Since starting as a CNN correspondent in 2019, Omar Jimenez has helped lead CNN's coverage on numerous national and international stories, including the murder of George Floyd, the first major COVID-19 outbreak in the United States, the sudden death of Kobe Bryant, the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse, and the recent killing of Amir Locke, just to name a few. While in Minneapolis covering protests after George Floyd's death, he and his team were handcuffed and detained live on air by Minnesota State Patrol. During the arrest, he, along with his, the CNN crew members, repeatedly identified themselves as reporters as they were handcuffed and taken into police custody. They identified themselves, they obeyed police orders, and they continued reporting on air so viewers at home could be informed, even as they were aware of possible dangers. His team was held for a little over an hour before they were released and could return back to their coverage. Over the ensuing months, he, he continued to tell the story of racial injustice in America, and he helped lead the network's coverage on both the trial and the conviction of the former officer found responsible for murdering Floyd. Throughout his time as a correspondent, Jimenez has also helped cover the impact of COVID-19 and some of the hardest hit areas of the United States, including from the inside of emergency rooms, in jails, in schools, and in numerous city hotspots. 
Jimenez won his first National News and Documentary Emmy Award in 2021 for his work covering the death of George Floyd. As a student, I am inspired by Amar's courage from continuing to report on live television while he and his crew were arrested, to returning to the ground shortly after to continue his coverage, and also to the rest of his vast career in the coverage of the Kyle Rittenhouse trial and also to the impact of COVID-19 and some of those hardest hit areas. I admire the grit and the dedication and the commitment to storytelling that he's shown throughout his work. And on behalf of the 2021 to 2022 McGill Fellows, I'm honored to present the 2021 McGill Medal for Journalistic Courage to Omar Jimenez. There we go. It's, uh, it's in here somewhere, I've been told. So I'll open it later. Let's see. Uh, we'll save that suspense for afterwards. But one, it's great to see all of you. I'm going to step over here. It's great to see all of you guys. Um, I mean, honestly, I think this is probably the biggest crowd I have been in front of in almost two years. So this, this feels, I'm going to see if I can remember how to do this. Usually I'm just talking to one camera, like right there. Um, for starters, uh, you guys, I've spoken to some of you. We had these symposiums earlier where we got, I got to know some of the students and hear from some of the students. You guys are an amazing group, and uh, I can't tell if you're always like this or if it's just because you finally beat Alabama. I, <laughs> honestly, round of applause for you. I, you finally got over that hump. You are no longer Nick Saban's children. Um, <laughs> So for those who don't know, I grew up in the Atlanta area, then went to Northwestern University in Chicago where I played basketball and I studied journalism. And I don't know, uh, I don't know if how many of you guys know student athletes, but at least for us at Northwestern, it was, it was really tough. We would go to practice three to four hours a day, then all go to the same classes everyone else would, then we were expected to go to the same parties, other social obligations, then expected to continue that cycle over the course of a year over and over again. I say that because life got pretty fast paced for me uh, pretty quickly. Like that sophomore year, I had just gotten a part-time internship with NBC, so what that meant was three times a week I was downtown reporting for my internship while in the middle of traveling the country for basketball season, trying to manage my normal cor course load and trying to manage having at least some sort of social life. I got my first summer internship, funny enough, with CNN in New York between my sophomore and junior years working back and forth with CNN International, primarily out of the United Nations. Next thing I know, at 19 years old, I was face to face with the UN Secretary General at a press conference as the world awaited results of chemical weapons investigations in Syria. Within a few weeks, I found myself on Late Night with Jimmy Fallon, rapping live on stage alongside the roots about a random topic I was given a single hour to make up a song for. At 21, I took a local reporting job in Baltimore where I was expected to perform like the people that had been there 21 years and on the heels of violent unrest over the death of Freddie Gray. At 23, I started at CNN, this time not as an intern, but at the white supremacist rallies in Charlottesville that became my first story. Within three months to the day later, I had covered two historic hurricanes, a catastrophic earthquake in Mexico, one of the most destructive wildfires in California history, and the deadliest mass shooting in modern American history out of Las Vegas. And of course, the pace didn't slow down from there. At 25, I was in my DC office one day watching the Notre Dame Cathedral burn, literally on Twitter like all of us were, when my boss peeked into my office and said, do you have your passport on you? In a few hours, I was in front of that very cathedral that was still smoldering and the cathedral I had just watched burn. And at 26, my CNN crew and I were handcuffed and detained live on television while reporting in Minneapolis on the murder of George Floyd. And I tell you this not, not to brag or to set some sort of ironclad standard, but because all of these are snapshots of moments where age didn't matter, experience didn't matter, nearly everything I had learned in a textbook no longer mattered. When everything goes out the window, all you're left with are your instincts, your subconscious preparation, and an incessant drive of, if I can just make it to the other side. These are all variations of moments that by most measures I shouldn't have been ready for, every single one of them. But that's not how they ended. Not necessarily because of what I studied or what I read, but because there was a certain comfort that I had done everything I could do, probably didn't do them perfectly, but did them the best I could. 
I found it easier to keep your cool when you're confident in the game that you're bringing to the table. And that confidence for me comes from preparation. Nearly every moment in my life where I haven't felt confident, it's because I wasn't prepared. But then that begs the question, if these are all situations where textbook learning goes out the window, how do you prepare for something you can't predict? I'll start with the least rewarding version of this, at least at first. There's a part of keeping your cool that stems from the comfort of knowing you're doing what you need to do. It's probably best summed up by Joel Embiid for NBA fans, trust the process. You can only control so much, so focus on that. Control it well, do what you need to do. Trust there will be a time when that skill, that work ethic, all of that, the expertise you're building either pays off or is needed. Relish in that grind. When I was at Northwestern's basketball team, averaging a stellar .3 points per game, <laughs> why did I keep showing up to practice? How did I not lose my mind demanding more playing time? It came from focusing on my game, believing there was going to be a moment where my number was going to be called and that I needed to be ready. And even if I was never called, there would be a comfort in knowing I had done everything I could possibly do. That's not to say there weren't nights where I, I was frustrated and angry, but at the end of the day, there was so much that was out of my control in that situation, wasting energy on that became exhausting. By looking at what was in front of me and what I could control, I was preparing for what I was trying to predict, but also for things I could never expect. And that brings me to the other part of keeping your cool, when those moments actually come. So for me, I would start with, I was put in these roles, whether it was a CNN intern, a CNN reporter, a local Baltimore reporter, I, I would get this sort of imposter syndrome. There's no way I should be here. There has to have been some sort of mistake. But clearly, someone saw enough of me to put me in this position, meaning there is a version of me that can do this, even if it's the version they see. I can't quite see it yet. So driven by this imposter syndrome, I was just doing the things I, was, I thought I was supposed to be doing. Reading, consuming as much information as possible, talking to whoever I needed to talk to, basically preparing for all the things I thought I was going to be faced with, trusting that process. But a funny thing happens when you do that over and over again, constantly pushing what you've seen others do, constantly building, never sure if you're actually doing the right thing or if you're just wasting your time. Going to empty press conference after empty press conference as an intern at the UN because at the time no one was really paying attention to it until they were. And then there I was doing my same routine, only this time in a packed room full of reporters the next thing I know, I'm lobbing questions at UN officials like I normally would, but it didn't hit me until the next day. What did I just do? Where am I? Because in the moment, I was locked in. It culminated in that moment, that moment when you realize you are actually prepared for something you never could have consciously studied for. It may not always be pretty, I'll admit that, and sometimes it takes a few hard lessons to get there, but when it happens, it's an amazing feeling. The stage, what was happening around me didn't matter because in that moment, my quiet confidence came from my sometimes painstaking preparation and the self-assured realization there is only so much I can control. It's one thing to feel like you know your stuff. It's another thing to feel like you belong. That's the preparation that translates to confidence. And again, that includes what you consciously studied for and what you didn't know you were building all along. And it's funny because I always remember thinking like, how do you watch LeBron James growing up and then get drafted and have to compete against him? It's because at the end of the day, in this metaphor, you're in the NBA. You know how to make a jump shot, hopefully. You go back, you revert back to what got you there and you play your game. No matter the moment, you do what you've always done. The stage just changes to keep the NBA metaphors going. It's a lot easier to hit game-winning free throws when you've practiced thousands of them. But you, of course, can't replicate the actual moment, the crowd noise, the weight of knowing that whatever you do now can change the course of potentially even history. You can't replicate that. But there's nothing more calming in a big moment than knowing you belong there. And now here I am alongside some of the same Anderson Coopers and Lester Holtz that I grew up watching, and while I still do freak out sometimes, I think at some point I realize there's a reason I'm here. Preparation leads to confidence, even in moments you would have never imagined. As the age-old saying goes, put in the work when no one's watching, 
you'll be ready when everyone is. Like the morning of May 29th, 2020. My team and I had been reporting on the murder of George Floyd for days at this point, at what seemed like all hours of the day and night from the ground in Minneapolis. This particular early morning, we rolled up to a six or seven story building just fully engulfed in flames. A crowd had gathered around it, no police or first responder presence at all as portions of this building began to collapse in on itself. All still in the darkness of the early morning. Despite the chaos, unfortunately we had gotten used to it at that point in the week, but despite that, we felt in this weird sort of comfort. We had N95 mask on at the time for the pandemic. Hard hats on for the unpredictability of debris, standing away from power lines because of the unpredictability of the fires that were going on, staying on the outside edges of the crowd because we always wanted to be able to easily escape in case things went south. We were live on the air this particular morning reporting on all of what we were seeing for multiple hours. We started at about 3.30, 4 a.m. that day, when all of a sudden, way off in the distance, after those few hours, we saw this line of law enforcement slowly advancing down the block. Eventually, they were part of a swarm of first responders that cleared out that entire intersection. We'd seen it coming, so we were off to the side, watching all this unfold as police formed a perimeter around this intersection. By the time we were doing our next report, they had formed a perimeter around us. Remember when I was talking about that confidence that comes from working with what you can control? I don't know if it had ever been tested like this. And there was a whole lot that was out of my control in that moment. All I could control were the words that kept coming out of my mouth into that live camera, the requests for any sort of guidance, any sort of communication from these officers, and doing everything in my power not to give even the impression that I was resisting wasn't enough to sway them, as my team and I were eventually led away in handcuffs on an American street doing a constitutionally protected job. We were held for about an hour and a half, and a lot was made about how I kept my cool in that moment, which was overall true. Nerves kicked in a little more as we were led away, but overall true. But that actually became more difficult once we were released. The attention of the world was on us, and I'm talking about number one trending topic on Twitter, YouTube, Reddit, everywhere you look, people were tweeting about us, reaching out to me, calling. I had to turn notifications off on my phone because it was unusable. We decided to go right back to the same intersection we had been plucked out of earlier in the morning, not to take our frustrations out on these officers, as the internet so badly wanted us to do, but to do our jobs. They wanted to take us out of the game, but we came right back, not with frustration, not with anger, but doing what we knew how to do, working with what was in our control, reporting the story. The best revenge was showing we weren't gonna let this stop us. Even when the Minnesota State Patrol put out a tweet saying we were only released once we are confirmed to be members of the media. No, they knew. But again, we could have freaked out about that. We could have let that throw us off of our game. We calmly refuted it and moved on. Because remember, why were we there in the first place? We were there to cover the horrific murder of George Floyd under the knee of that Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin, for nine minutes and 29 seconds. With all of the fanfare, attention, retweets from celebrities and more, it would have been easy to make that day about me. Look how great I was. Look how great my crew was standing up for American values. We had to ground ourselves with the fact that the focus needed to remain on the bigger story. We had to work with what we could control. We had to fall back to what we knew how to do. There was so much added attention on us and everything we did, it was a different type of keeping your cool. Up until that point for me, it had been trusting the process, then being confident in the fact that I belonged, and now was realizing that despite what the world may think, I couldn't waver from what got me to that moment in the first place, just because the circumstances around me were now different. A lot of this business, this journalism business, is that level-headedness, head knowing you are tasked with going where most people are never going to go, and you are their guide. You have to know how to listen without being patronizing, how to tell a story without losing its meaning. You have to have the empathy to put yourself in someone else's shoes even if they don't match your own. 
You're going to be in rooms that most people would kill to be in. Expected to uphold a constitutional right that is bigger than any individual bad day. And I know this is supposed to be a journalism-specific talk, but in most of what I've said, I've purposely left that out because a lot of the success in this industry doesn't come from journalistic tactics or strategies. It comes from listening, from learning, from being a human to other humans. That means learn. And by that, I mean live. And by that, I mean step outside your comfort zone when it's on your terms because it's not always going to be on your terms. In reporting, some of the best advice I've gotten is that being a reporter is 60% intelligence, 30% storytelling, 10% presentation. You can teach presentation. You can teach storytelling. You can't teach that 60%. That 60% comes from you. What are you bringing to the table? What natural curiosities, reading habits, your behavior when no one is watching, where are you getting what makes you, you? And there's no one formula. To this day, I've always had guidance, but I don't think I've ever had a tutorial. Of course, that would be the more comfortable route, but what I've found to have gotten me this far isn't walkthroughs or a beginner's guide. It's all of a sudden being thrown to the wolves, sinking or swimming, the real life manifestation of trial by fire and realizing that I can make it to the other side as long as I trust me. For me, preparation has led to confidence, which has helped me approach some big situations with a mindset as cool as the other side of the pillow, as the late great Stuart Scott would say. It's not to say I don't have nerves, I still get nervous, but what eventually calms me down is knowing that I've done everything I can do, and that comfort has allowed me to be in rooms people would tell me I'm not supposed to be in, and to do things people would tell me I am too young to be doing. I heard Will Smith once say the biggest rewards on the other, are on the other side of fear. Well, once you've made it to the other side once, then again, then again, it doesn't matter what you get thrown at you as long as you remember, you can always control your feet and dodge. Cooler heads always prevail, and that applies to our business too. So it's my absolute pleasure to humbly accept the McGill Medal for Journalistic Courage, as voted on by journalists, educators, and of course, the latest class of McGill Fellows. And for those who didn't vote, there are so many people to thank, mainly my mom, who is here today, who found a way to manage three boys. Please give it up for my mom. We all turned out halfway decently, and behind her, my younger brother, who is here, a senior at University of Georgia, who I can no longer make Bama jokes about. So, <laughs> But of course, there are so many other family members, friends, colleagues, and more, who have all, in one way or another, forged the person you see here today, and I wouldn't change a thing, not just because I'd be worried about affecting the ever-expanding multiverse or upsetting Doctor Strange, but because I be I've become better every step of the way through these people. So thank you all so much for having me down here in Athens, and even though it was Go Cats, where I came from at Northwestern, I think I can make an exception when I say, Go Dogs. <laughs> that was painful to say. That, that was, Go Dogs painful, but... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, would you mind taking some questions? Yeah, yeah, as I understand, it's a Q&A, so... Yeah, um, we have a, a mic, if you want to just like, raise your hand, and we'll uh, do a talk show style. And sweet. Kind of like, we'll, we'll try something out. I'll screen you, I'll with this. <laughs> yeah, so anyone have any questions? I'm happy to talk about uh, whatever you'd like. Um, the journey, guidance, got me here. Happy to talk about whatever you'd like. The journey got me here, Xbox. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think there's one, yeah, or get you next. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, so my question is, on that day when they detained you, did they take you away, like to book y'all? Yeah, so um, what many people saw on camera was, you know, they had their arms on me, I continued to report. They eventually put my arms behind my back and led me away from the camera which was really the moment where things got a lot more real for at least me. Because I had this weird sort of comfort, this, this cushion of professionalism when the camera was looking at me because all of you guys could see me, right? We're, you, you were just seeing what's happening. There's no misunderstanding about me doing anything. But once 
the camera panned away and I was led toward this line of police officers that opened up, swallowed me in, and then closed up behind me, that's when I wasn't really sure what was gonna happen next. And eventually my other crew members were uh, cuffed and detained as well. They put us in a police van and then took us uh, downtown, so to speak. And we were there for about, um, about an hour and a half or so, but the governor called. Um, he had seen what had happened and uh, got us released. Oh, okay. So y'all didn't have to pay bond or anything? No, and if there was a bond, I think the governor was going to take care of that. Okay. So, <laughs> so good to hear. Oh, it's, it's already one thing to have been arrested, but if you had to pay money to get out, too. Then that's oh, yeah. Worse. Yeah, definitely. Right. Well, even if we had to pay, we would have gone right to the governor and been like, look, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. All right, there's one back there. Hi, I'm Julie. Um, if you could give advice to young student journalists like high schoolers or tell yourself in high school, what would your advice be? And how did you get into journalism to like your background, like from like high school, like not just college? Like how did you decide that you wanted to be a journalist? Yeah, yeah. so um, I'll, I'll do the second one first. I decided I wanted to do it um, it started kind of differently, where just growing up, I, I played a lot of sports and I watched Sports Center all the time. And I loved watching Stuart Scott and Scott Van Pelt in Sports Center. They were like my duo growing up. So they were the ones that sort of got me interested in covering things, so to speak. I got to college, started covering sports, didn't really like it as much as I thought I was going to. I didn't like having to do homework to go to a football game, you know? <laughs> Um, so then I switched over to news and I leaned more into my classwork, which was getting me more in the community. And what I found was that you can include sports coverage in the wider world of news and news allowed me to incorporate other things in the community and some of the more complicated issues of politics. It just seemed like there was a wider net for me to take advantage of. So I made that switch in college, did it, felt like I was good at it, enjoyed it. And then once I got my first job locally in Baltimore, um, that sort of cemented like, okay, you know what? I feel like I'm on a good path. Let's see where this goes. And then here I am. Where were you working in Baltimore? I'm from Maryland. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was uh, Channel 11, WBAL. Okay, I yeah. grew up in Montgomery County, so. Oh, amazing, yeah. it's a great area. And, um, and then on your, on your first question about uh, advice that I would give, it's kind of what I was talking about in this, uh, in this lecture was that I stumbled into this idea of, of knowing that you can only control so much. I think in the beginning, there's a lot of pressure that you feel like you need to do everything, that you feel like you look at your, your idols, you know, whoever they may be, and you forget that they went through 10 years of steps, 10 to 15 years of steps to get where they are now. Um, and I think understanding that and fighting the battles that are in front of you instead of whatever imaginary battles you think are out there, you don't realize that you're slowly making your way down that same path. Um, and so for me, again, it was focusing on, all right, what can I control about me? If I am the best reporter I can be, I'm less worried about whatever situation or story I get thrown into because I feel confident in what I'm bringing to the table. So that was developing good reading habits. I think that's a really good one to just like a tactile thing you can do, find a good rotation of five to six publications that you're reading every morning. Even if it's just like a newsletter, five to six newsletters. Take, takes 25, 30 minutes to do it. That way, all right, you're building a little bit of a, of a repertoire, of an expertise. Then maybe it's like things as simple as you live in a community, you've never been to the state fair. Go to the state fair. Why do people keep going to the state fair? Are people weird at the state fair? You don't know unless you go. Um, it's things like that where you're just sort of bettering yourself um, and the rest will come. You just have to be patient. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. So we know what is your most famous story. I actually showed the clip in my class this afternoon of, of your being detained. In your career, what story are you most proud of? In my career? Mm -hmm. um, it's a really good question. I mean, 
there have been so many that, that have really had an impact on me, especially even just the past two years. Um, I think some of the early, uh, some of the COVID-19 coverage um, this, this year, oh, you know what, right, here's one that maybe not be my whole career because I can't think of that right now, but one that I'm really proud of was when uh, during the vaccine rollout, um, you know, I'm based in Chicago and uh, I'm half Colombian and I speak Spanish. And there is this neighborhood in Chicago that's uh, majority Mexican and I, and they were being devastated by the pandemic. Chicago's Hispanic community was being affected at a rate higher than, than most other demographics. And we had no coverage on it. Like we, we just were missing it in the country and the third largest city in the country. And so I reached out to some folks down there and we did basically a, a story in Spanish that I had to translate. But what I found was that there's a such rich background that I got about the fight for vaccines where there was one, they were complaining about the fact that the clinics or the vaccine hours were only on like a nine to five working basis when a lot of the working class families here were working through those hours, were working night shifts. And even if they were free, they were trying to figure out how to, how to get childcare. A lot of them, just pure language barrier alone, were having difficulty parsing through the the convoluted CDC guidance and things like that. They were just having these difficulties. And you know, you're looking at the US population as a whole, the Hispanic group is the largest growing group that we've seen. And I just remember after we put together this story, talking to families in Spanish and hearing what they had to say and seeing the reaction, by the way, and how thankful they were to be included on CNN. Uh, to me, that, that was really powerful um, because that's kind of what journalism's all about, you know? Shining a light on people who feel like they've been forgotten. And sometimes you get caught up in the politics and the breaking news and the shiny object. You sort of forget the core mission of why you do what you do. And that was a reminder, of course. Yeah. Come to you next. Hi there. Uh, fellow wildcat living here among the dogs. Oh, go cats. <laughs> go cats. So. In your time in the business, how has your perspective on the courage that it takes to be a journalist changed? Mm -hmm. And obviously your experiences have changed that, but give us the broader view and then, and then the ground level view for you. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think the broader view is, it, it does take more courage to go into journalism today, I think maybe than ever before, because there, there's the courage, of course, of covering the subject matter, right? That might be difficult to cover, but the, the social media climate, the political climate, it, it just feels like there's a lot more scrutiny on journalists and a lot more hate and vitriol for journalists in the media than there's been in at least a very long time. And so for the up and coming journalists, they now have to consider, okay, if I go cover the state house and wherever, am I okay getting th death threats? Even if I'm just covering politics. And then that becomes your daily life. Oh, all right, I got two death threats this week. All right, I got, I got three the next week. Oh, this is down from the week before. That's not a normal life. You know, most people don't live that way, but it, but it sort of has become the norm and the ease of access that people have to, to public figures can be a good thing. But in many cases, when it comes to criticism, when it comes to people spewing their mind out onto the internet, it can be tough and even demoralizing for a lot of people starting out. So I say it takes more courage than maybe it ever has, but also I think it is incredibly rewarding to when you see a story go right and some of that same outpour that you expect to be hate is love and appreciation for the work that you do. Um, I think for me personally, you know, I'm in a unique, w within along those same lines, I mean, one, CNN has been in the headlines recently in the past uh, few weeks personnel-wise, but I think just it's no secret we were a frequent target of the previous administration, and that complicated a lot of things. I'm a national correspondent, so I go into a lot of these small towns in the Midwest, and that affects me, because why is all of a sudden a person in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, who I've never met, who they've never seen a story of me accusing me of being fake news when I'm covering a school shooting? Like, this is 
this is affecting your community. And so I think I am now having to think within that lens when we go to certain places, like maybe we have to be more on our guard. Maybe we have to think about how we approach this story strategically so that everyone here is safe and we can still tell this story. So I think that's how it's changed for me. The subject matter, I think, is always going to be difficult. I think it's always going to be challenging. I don't think we can shy away from that. Um, but I think personally, there are a lot of factors that we now have to take into consideration safety-wise um, that I haven't before. And I will say one other thing I thought of was as my profile grew, I now had to start thinking about, you know, how often am I posting my location on Instagram or my or on Twitter, things that it's like, you know, hey, University of Georgia this week, or like, it's, they're just things that you now have to think of. And knowing that there are people who are targeting journalists or have a specific hate to journalists, or at least would harm them if given the opportunity. So, yeah. Go Cats. Thanks again for being here today. As a follow-up to that, so as you go through your mind and you're reporting live, is there, in terms of the checklist of how you're preparing for a story or how you're preparing to go live, is there anything that you're doing differently than you would have done pre, I guess, that Minneapolis incident? Um, not necessarily strategy-wise. I think it's always sort of been, I read into the story as much as possible, know as much as I can. And then I try to lay out tent poles, so to speak. Try to pick three or four points that I know I want to hit. And then I just talk about those specific points. And if there's certain ways I want to say something, I might write out that sentence just so I can remember. I'm like, oh, that, sound, that just sounds good. It summarizes this well. Um, but I think after that, um, the only thing that really changed for me job-wise was sort of understanding or grappling with the fact that there is this version of me that you all see, you know, that the outside world sees. Everyone has this idea of what I am and what I should be. And then there's me, like, I, you know, who I wake up every day. I, I know who I am. Um, and it's sort of realizing that there is that distance. When you meet someone in the street, they know you as this certain thing, and so you should fulfill that role. You know, they see you as a, a great reporter and they don't, they can't possibly understand that I've been up for 24 hours straight and uh, want to hit anything that moves because I'm so tired and I just want to go to sleep. You understand that they see you in this role and you have a responsibility to fulfill that role. Um, and I think that's maybe the only thing that's changed for me um, when it comes to approaching my, my daily life. Some good questions. Um, going back to like your the story you were most proud of when you said you like went into the Mexican community, you helped them. That like made my heart really happy. I don't know how I missed it <laughs> because I back at home was helping my community as well, and it was it's it's hard because yeah. a lot of stuff wasn't translated well, and a lot of people didn't get it. Um, how would you say? And I feel like you probably talked about hours with this. Um, how did you go about it? Uh, really, yeah. I I know that's not a simple answer or a simple question to answer, but how do you go about it? Because that's something I would like to do um, as a Mexican woman, like in journalism. I want to be able to be someone people can go to. If that makes any sense? So, yeah. Um, yeah. If you could answer. That. Yeah. So um, one, it began with trying to find a way to pitch the story. Right. CNN's a big place, and so um, you know, and so, you know, my direct reports aren't Latino. And so I knew that my pitch was going to have to come with like a separate set of explanation for like, okay, no, this is why it's like it's particularly meaningful in this community. Um, so there's a little bit of a higher hurdle there. It's just the reality. Wish it was better, but it is what it is. Then once you have the opportunity to do to do this story, I would actually look at your own experiences. So uh, Mexican, think about what you would want covered or what you feel like you were missing as you were growing up or that you didn't see being covered. And use that to sort of guide your, your curiosity in some of these neighborhoods. So if, for example, if you're in Chicago and you're looking at the Little Village neighborhood and you're like, you know what, for me, I always felt like no one was talking about Latino mothers. You know, the Latino mother struggle was left out of 
everything, like my mom should have gotten more shine because of what she did. So you use that to guide you. You go like, I wonder if I could tell the story of, of, of getting a COVID vaccine through the lens of a Latino mother. You see what I'm saying? You sort of lean into your own experiences, not to bias your reporting or not to, not to cloud it in any way, but to guide your curiosity into finding stories. And I think that's the best way for you to, to, to start that up. And it's probably the most authentic way for you to start it up. And it'll feel rewarding because at the end of it, you'll be like, wow, like I answered my own question. I can actually do that. I'm a, I'm a journalist, you know? Um, so that's how I would say going about that. And I would also advise that if, you, if that's a beat that you want to pursue, be about where you move or where you do that reporting because I think some of the best story, the reason why that story worked so well was because that Chicago neighborhood isn't always covered. It's, it's truly a minority within a city that, where people usually focus on something else. And you can take, I guess, journalistic advantage of that by looking at underrepresented areas and saying, I can, I can bring this community to light. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hello. Hey. <laughs> um, since we were talking, um, we were talking earlier about um, just the fire that the media has been under in the past administration, and especially CNN was a big butt of that fire um, from the previous president. And I was wondering what can journalists do and up and coming journalists uh, to help heal that divide and that mistrust of the media, and even if that, how much of our responsibility that is if we're doing our job the most, which is like telling the truth? Yeah, I mean, that is the million dollar question right now, where every organization is trying to figure out how do we heal this, this, these parallel worlds where people are just getting completely different sets of information. And both sides would swear that what they're reading from is the, is the correct version. Um, I would say one, you can't shy away from it, I think. If there are communities that, that are spewing things that just don't make sense, you can't just say, okay, they're crazy. I'm just gonna stick over here. No, why are they saying that? Every, whenever you go into a lot of these communities where they have these beliefs, a lot of times it's not some big deep-seated conspiracy. It's just they saw it on Facebook or they heard it from somewhere else and they now go along with it. And we've actually done some stories. We have a misinformation um, team that's being formed, but some of our stories we've gone through and um, we'd go into some of these communities where getting the vaccine seems like the worst thing possible. Yet you talk through some of these, these theories that people have, and it's not that the theories make sense, but it's their reasoning for why they believe the theories that start to make sense, and I think that is a very powerful moment. Because what you do by then publishing that story and pursuing that story is you then help other people understand. And by understanding, you get compassion. And I think that's really what's missing in this. It's, there's two sides completely just yelling at each other. No one's really listening to each other. Um, media's kind of caught in the middle. One side is blaming us for what the other side is hearing. And it's just this nasty situation right now. And I don't know if it gets better, or if we just get used to how this is. I mean, it's kind of a, it's just how I'm looking at it right now, because I think social media has a role to play as well, and that's a whole separate conversation. But, but as far as what we can do to make it better, I'll just have to go back to what I was saying earlier. There's only so much you can control. Do the best job you can do, follow your curiosities, and as a journalist, you just have to hope that People see your work, trust what you do, and build it one block at a time. That's my optimistic view on it. Thank you. Yeah. We have one more back. Yeah, for sure. Bring us home. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yes, yeah, better be an amazing question. Oh my God, I'll try <laughs> to make it good. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I think in recent years, especially the past few months, there's been a lot of discourse on what objectivity means for journalists and how identity plays a role in journalism. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to hear in the way you kind of talk about your stories, you connect with them deeply, whether they're national or local. I want to hear what 
kind of role empathy plays in your journalism and um, how you incorporate that into interviewing sources, especially in times of crisis when it's a breaking news story. Um, yeah, how, how do you kind of maintain that trust? And this kind of ties into some of the stuff you were talking about earlier. Yeah, and I would say that's one of those skills that's not a journalistic skill. It's not a strategy that you're gonna all of a sudden read in a textbook and be like, all right, I have empathy now. No, it's, <laughs> it's like something you, you go out and live and experience in the world, you know? Um, and so it play, it's, it's everything. It, it literally is everything and the work that I do. Someone in politics, you know, who covers politics that might be a little different. Um, but for me, I'm going into, I'm flying into Minneapolis to cover the story of a, of a kid who got shot and killed wrongfully in a no-knock warrant. And now I'm sitting down with the parents of that family. There is nothing in the textbook that's gonna prepare you to speaking, for speaking with a mother who had just lost her son four days prior. So what do you do? You approach it like you would someone on the street. I'm so sorry, only talk about what you're comfortable with, but tell me about who he was. Because if you're thinking in your head, there's no way she would want to immediately talk about, so tell me you know, about this body camera, this gruesome body camera footage. No, think about what she would want to talk about. And then now you're actually talking. And once you've built sort of this comfort, you're sort of seeing what she feels comfortable with and uh, you kind of have felt each other out, then you can maybe ask some of the tougher questions, delicately, but some of the tougher questions and what ends up happening is you have an authentic conversation. That's, I think, the goal when you sit down with any of these people. Because at the end of the day, you're strangers, right? You're meeting for the very first time, yet you're trying to get them to share intimate details about their feelings, their mindset, their emotions. How do you get that without building some sort of trust with them, even in just the first 10 to 15 minutes? And in some of those interviews, I actually will purposefully sit with them longer knowing I'm only gonna use the last 20 minutes of the interview, but because I just kinda of wanna get them talking, get to know them, get to feel them out just a little bit. So empathy is everything. And uh, another aspect where I think about that a lot is kind of what we were talking about in the, uh, in the story in Latino neighborhoods is there's an idea of an objective story, of a you know, non-biased story or whatever, but there's also this idea of a complete story. And they go hand in hand where an objective story might be, you know, something happens, you talk to, you hear, you talk to the mayor, you talk to the police chief, you talk to a community activist. All right, cool. You've checked all your boxes, so to speak. But a complete story is when you look at yourself and your backgrounds and your experiences and say, you know what? I grew up in similar neighborhoods like this, or I went through something similar. Here's what I would have wanted to know. Here's what people are missing or wouldn't have seen in their coverage and you use your, literally your bias of just being who you are to guide where you look to tell a story, you know? Um, and so that's just something you should think about. Um, you don't have to pretend to be a robot. No one wants to see a robot. They wanna see you, the professional, but they wanna see you, so. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs>